Welcome back to the Trading Post. It's me, Fred. And this here, of course, is the star of the show, as always. Good old Noodle. Hey, Noodle, what are we going to do today, man? What are we going to talk about this time? Huh? Huh? Tell them. Tell the good people out there what we're going to do. What are we going to do? What are we going to talk about today? Well, everybody, we're going to talk about Lost Treasures, Episode 4, Alaric's Treasure. I hope y'all's ready for this one because this is this is interesting, you know. I mean, every episode we do, we we research and we get dig into this stuff and we find out all kind of cool, interesting things. Now, just so you know, this right here has a reason. Okay, we're gonna talk about the Visigoths, okay, aka the barbarians. And I don't know if this is exactly the way they painted their faces, but I'm sure they probably did. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. If I am, comment down below and let me know. Say, hey, you're an idiot. But either way, it makes it fun. So let's have some fun. Let's enjoy ourselves. We're going to talk about some stuff. Good old Noodle's having fun already. Look at him. Look at this little bastard. He's something else. Boy, I'm going to tell you what. You you drive me nuts sometimes. You know that? You need to go to bed. It's past your curfew. Anyways. All right. Thank you, my Trading Post family, for tuning in, for wanting to watch and see my goofy, my goofy self doing another episode. All right. I love you. I appreciate you all. Thank you very much for your support, your love. You know, and as I said, you know, the Trading Post family, we're, we're here for each other. You know what I mean? We're going to find our own truth. All right. What that is, who the hell knows? Only we'll know in the end. Right. But we can try to play devil's advocate. We can do, we can play both sides of the field and we can come to our own conclusion, you know? See what kind of facts they have, what kind of this and that, what kind of myths they have, and then conclude at our own conclusion. And no one's going to judge you on this channel for your own conclusion, okay? Because we don't play that game around here. Now, let's get into this, y'all, okay? I got a lot of notes on this one. I was actually surprised I got as many as I did because this... We're going to start off, and this is uh, one of the, one of the resources I used as far as notes, okay? And this resource says, you know, this is legend. It wasn't proved. The year it was lost, the treasure, was 410, okay? 410. We're talking a ways back, y'all. 410. After the sacking of Rome in 410, the Visigoths fled to southern Italy in Calabria. There, their king, Alaric, suddenly died from illness and was buried with his treasure in an unknown river, often reported to be the Bucento. Okay, there's no guarantee that that's what it is, but that's what they reported it was. Let's just go with it, okay? Let's, let's roll with this. Now, okay, Alaric I, or Alaric, A-L-A-R-I-K-S, ruler of all is what that means, Alaric, okay, circa 370 to 411 A.D., was the first king of the Visigoths from 395 to 410. He rose to leadership of the Goths who came to occupy Moesia territory acquired a couple of decades earlier by a combined force of Goths and Alans after the Battle of Adrianople. Note, Visigoths were a Germanic people united under the rule of a king and living within the Roman Empire during late antiquity. Now, Moesia is another note, was an ancient region and later Roman province situated in the Balkans south of the Danube River. Moesia included territory of eastern Serbia, Kosovo, northeastern Albania, northern parts of North Macedonia, northern Bulgaria, Romanian 
Dobruja, and small parts of southern Ukraine. Alaric I was king of the Visigoths, as said prior. His reign was from 395 to 410 AD. His coronation was in 395. His predecessor was Athanaric, and his successor was Atalf. He was born, unknown, circa 370, roughly, in Puce Island, Danube Delta, now Romania. He died in 411, aged around 40 years old, in Consentia, Italia, Roman Empire, which is now Cosenza, Italy. His burial was in Vicento River in Calabria, Italy. Alaric began his career under the Gothic soldier Gainus and later joined the Roman army. Once an ally of Rome, Rome under the Roman Emperor Theodosius, Alaric helped defeat the Franks and other allies of a would-be Roman usurper. Despite losing many thousands of his men, he received little recognition from Rome and left the Roman army disappointed. After the death of Theodosius and the disintegration of the Roman armies in 395, he is described as king of the Visigoths, as the leader of the only effective field force remaining in the Balkans. He sought Roman legitimacy, never quite achieving a position acceptable to himself or to the Roman authorities. He operated mainly against the successive Western Roman reg regimes and marched into Italy, where he died. He is responsible for the sack of Rome in 410, one of several notable events in the Western Roman Empire's eventual decline. Note, the Franks. The Franks were a Western European people. They started as a Germanic people who lived near the Lower Rhine. They eventually expanded their power and influence onto much of the population of Western Europe, particularly in and near France. Okay, now that we got the notes and all that, this is the, that was the beginning. Okay, we got this all out of the way. If you have any questions, any comments, throw them down below. Email me if you want at thetradingpost8124 at gmail.com. Okay? I may not have said that enough. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I also need to put that in the comments or put a link to it. I'm sorry. I'm still learning, y'all. Okay? I'm just a dumb hillbilly. I'm learning. Give me some time. If you have an issue or a problem, just let me know. Okay? I'm trying to figure this out. I'm trying to work out the kinks. All right? Now, let's continue on. Early life, federate status in the Balkans. According to Jordanes, a 6th century Roman bureaucrat of Gothic origin who later turned his hand to history, Alaric was born on Puce Island at the mouth of the Danube Delta in present-day Romania and belonged to the noble Balti dynasty of the Ther Thervingian Goths. There is no way to verify this claim. Historian, historian Douglas Boyne does not make such an unequivocal assessment about Alaric's Gothic heritage and instead claims he came from either the Thervingi or the Gruthung tribes. When the Goths suffered setbacks against the Huns, they made a mass migration across the Danube and fought a war with Rome. Alaric was probably a child at this time who grew up along Rome's periphery. Alaric's upbringing was shaped by living along the border of Roman territory in a region that the Romans viewed as a veritable backwater. Some four centuries before, the Roman poet Ovid regarded the area along the Danube and Black Sea where Alaric was reared, was reared as a land of barbarians, among the most remote in the vast world. Alaric's childhood in the Balkans, where the Goths had settled by way of an agreement with Theodosius, was spent in the company of veterans who had fought at the Battle of Adrianople in, in 378 during which they had annihilated much of the eastern army and killed Emperor Valens. Imperial campaigns against the Visigoths were conducted until a treaty was reached in 382. 
This treaty was the first FOTUS on Imperial Rome soil and required these semi-autonomous Germanic tribes, among whom Alaric was raised, to supply troops for the Roman army in exchange for peace, control of cult cultivatable land, and freedom from Roman direct administrative control. Correspondingly, there was hardly a region along the Roman frontier during Alaric's day without Gothic slaves and servants of one form or another. For several subsequent decades, many Goths like Alaric were called upon, were called up into, into regular units of the Eastern Field Army, while others served as auxiliaries in campaigns led by Theodosius against the Western usurpers Magnus, Maximus, and Eugenius. Okay, now, Rebellion against Rome, rise to Gothic leadership. That is our next subject. A new phase in the relationship between the Goths and the Empire resulted from the treaty signed in 382. As more and more Goths attained arist aristocratic rank from their service in the Imperial Army, Alaric began his military career under the Gothic soldier Gaianus, and later joined the Roman army. He first appeared as a leader of a mixed band of Goths and allied peoples who invaded Thrace in 391, but were stopped by the half-Vandal Roman general Stilicho. While the Roman poet Claudian belittled Alaric as a little-known menace terrorizing southern Thrace during this time, Alaric's abilities and forces were formidable enough to prevent the Roman Emperor Theodosius from crossing the Hebrus River. Now, we're going to talk about service under Theodosius I. By 392, Alaric had entered Roman military service, which, which coincided with a reduction of hostilities between Goths and Romans. In 394, he led a Gothic force that helped Emperor Theodosius defeat the Frankish usurper Arbogast. Fighting at the behest of Eugenius at the Battle of Frig Frigidus, despite sacrificing around 10,000 of his men, who had been victims of Theodosius' callous tactical decision to overwhelm the enemy's front lines using Gothic foederati, Alaric received little recognition from the emperor. Alaric was among the few who survived the protracted and bloody affair. Many Romans considered it their gain and a victory that so many Goths had died during the Battle of, the, of, of Frigidus River. That's pretty jacked up, y'all. I don't give a damn. <coughs> I don't give a damn. It's not right. This is the past. What they did back then was totally different than what it is now. Okay, We don't understand their terms, the way that they did things. But the fact is, present day, the way that I see this, it wasn't right. Okay? You can yell at me in the comments. I don't give two shits. The point is, my opinion is my opinion. Your opinion is your opinion. So throw it out there. If you have an opinion, throw it out. Don't be shy about it. I don't give a damn. I'll listen to it. We take all judgment and criticism in an enlightening way on this channel. Okay, we we don't care. We're gonna differentiate the bullshit. That's what we do, and that's what you're gonna do in your own way. So now let's continue on. Alaric bi Alaric biographer Douglas Boyne in 2020 posited that seeing 10,000 of his dead kinsmen likely elicited questions about what kind of ruler Theodosius actually had been whether remaining in direct Roman service was best for men like him. Refused the reward he accepted, which included a promotion to the position of magister, militum, and command of regular Roman units. Alaric mutinied and began to march against Constantinople. On January 17, 395, Theodosius died of an illness, leaving his two young and incapable sons, Arcadius and Honorius in Stilicho's guard guardianship. Give me a second here, y'all. Right. Okay, now. All right. 
On January 17, 395, Theodosius died of an illness, leaving his two young and incapable sons, Arcadius and Honorius, in Stilicho's guardianship. Modern writers regard Alaric as king of the Visigoths from 395. According to historian Peter Heather, it is not entirely clear in the sources if Alaric rose to prominence at the time the Goths revolted following Theodosius' death, or if he had already risen within his tribe as early as the war against Eugenius. Whatever the circumstances, Jordanes recorded that the new king persuaded his people to seek a kingdom by their own exertions rather than serve others in idleness. Now note, Magister Militum equals uh, was a top-level military command used in the later Roman Empire dating from the region of Constantine the Great. The term referred to the senior military officer. So he was a high-ranking person, and he turned that down. Okay, that's what they're saying. He was offered this position and turned it down. You know, what's up, buddy? He's, he's, I think he's just tired. He's wore out. Okay, semi-independent action in Eastern Rome, Roman interests, Eastern Roman recognition. That's the next subject. So, whether or not Alaric was a member of an ancient Germanic royal clan, as claimed by Jordanes and debated by historians, is less important than his emergence as a leader, the first of his kind since Fritigern. Never heard of Fritigern, but we're, I guess we're gonna maybe, maybe we'll find out about him. Theodosius's death left the Roman field armies collapsing, and the empire divided again between his two sons, one taking the eastern and the other the western portion of the empire. Stilicho made himself master of the west and attempted to establish control in the east as well and led an army into Greece. Alaric rebelled again. Historian Roger Collins points out that while the rivalries created by the two halves of the empire vying for power worked to Alaric's advantage and that, that of his people, simply being called to authority by the Gothic people did not solve the practicalities of their needs for survival. He needed Roman authority in order to be supplied by Roman cities. Alaric took his Gothic army on what Stilicho's pro propagandist Claudian described as a pillaging campaign that began first in the east. Historian Thomas Burns' interpretation is that Alaric and his men were recruited by Rufinus's eastern reg regime in Constantinople and sent to Thessaly to stave off Stilicho's threat. No battle took place. Alaric's forces made their way down to Athens and along the coast where he sought to force a new peace upon the Romans. In 396, he marched through Thermopylae and sacked Athens where archaeological evidence shows widespread damage to the city. Stilicho's pro propagandist Claudian accuses his troops of plundering for the next year or so as far south as the mountainous Peloponnese Peninsula, and reports that only Stilicho's surprise attack with his western field army, having sailed from Italy, stemmed the plundering as he pushed Alaric's forces north, north into Epirus. Zosimus adds that Stilicho's troops destroyed and pillaged too, and let Alaric's men escape with their plunder. Stilicho was forced to send some of his eastern forces home. They went to Constantinople under the command of, the, of one Gainus, a, Gothic, a Goth with a large Gothic following. On arrival, Gainus murdered Rufinus and was appointed Magister Militum for Thrace by Eutropius, the new supreme minister and the only eunuch consul of Rome, who Zosimus claims controlled Arcadius as if he were a sheep. A poem by Senecius advises Aradius to display manly, manliness to remove a skin-clad savage, probably referring to Alaric, from the councils of power and his barbarians from the Roman army. 
We do not know if Arcadius can become, uh, if Arcadius ever became aware of this advice, but it had no recorded effect. Stilicho obtained a few more troops from the German frontier and continued to campaign indecisively against the Eastern Empire. Again, he was opposed by Alaric and his men. During the next year, 397, Eutropius personally led his troops to victory over some Huns, over some Huns who were marauding in Asia Minor. With his position thus strengthened, he declared Stilicho a public enemy, and he established Alaric as Magister Militum per Illyricum. Alaric thus acquired entitlement to gold and grain for his followers, and negotiations were underway for a, for a more permanent settlement. Stilicho's supporters in Milan were outraged at this seeming, seeming betrayal. Meanwhile, Eutropius was celebrated in 398 by a parade through Constantinople for having achieved victory over the rules of the north. All right. Alaric's people were relatively quiet for the next couple of years. In 399, Eutropius fell from power. The new eastern regime now felt that they could dispense with Alaric's services, and they nominally transferred Alaric's province to the west. This administrative change moved Alaric's Roman rank and his entitlement to legal provisioning for his men, leaving his army the only significant force in the ravaged Balkans as a problem for Stilicho. Now, we're going to talk about in search of Western Roman recognition and invading Italy. First invasion of Italy was circa 401 to 403. According to historian Michael Kulikowski, sometime in the spring of 402, Alaric decided to invade Italy, but no sources from antiquity indicate to what purpose. Burns suggests that Alaric was probably desperate for, for provisions. Using Claudian as his source, historian Guy Halsall reports that Alaric's attack actually began in late 401. But since Stilicho was in Raetia dealing with frontier issues, the two did not first confront one another in, in Italy until 402. Alaric's entry into Italy followed the route identified in the poetry of Claudian as he crossed the peninsula's alpine frontier near the city of Aquileia. For a period of, of six to nine months, there were reports of Gothic attacks along the northern Italian roads where Alaric was spotted by Roman townspeople. Along the route on Via Postumia, Alaric first encountered Stilicho. Two battles were fought. The first was at Palentia, on Easter Sunday, where Stilicho, according to Claudian, achieved an impressive victory, taking Alaric's wife and children prisoner, and more significantly, seizing much of the treasure that Alaric had amassed over the previous five years. So he took a lot of his treasure, he took his family. God damn, that's bad. Bro, you don't want to do that. You don't want to take somebody's family, man. You better be prepared. But the previous five years worth of plundering. Okay, let's continue this. Pursuing the retreating forces of Alaric, Stilicho offered to return the prisoners, but was refused. The second battle was at Verona, where Alaric was defeated for a second time. Stilicho once again offered Alaric a truce and allowed him to withdraw from Italy. Kulikowski explains this confusing, this, this confusing if not outright conciliatory behavior by stating, given Stilicho's Cold War with Constantinople, it would have been foolish to destroy as biddable and violent a potential weapon as Alaric might well prove to be. Halsall's observations are similar, as he contends that the Roman general's decision to permit Alaric's withdrawal with Pannonia makes sense if we see Alaric's force entering Stilicho's service and Stilicho's victory being less total than Claudian would have, us to, would have us to believe. Perhaps more revealing is a report from the Greek historian Zosimus, writing a half a century later, that indicates an agreement was concluded between Stilicho and Alaric 
in 405, which suggests Alaric being in Western service at that point, likely stemming from arrangements made back in 402. Between 404 and 405, Alaric remained in one of the four Pannonian provinces from where he could play east off against west while potentially, potentially threatening both. Historian A.D. Lee observes Alaric's return to the northwest Balkans brought only temporary respite to Italy, for in 405 another substantial body of Goths and other barbarians, this time from outside the empire, crossed the middle Danube and advanced into northern Italy, where they plundered the countryside and besieged cities and towns under their leader, Redagas, 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 damn it, Although the imperial government was struggling to muster enough troops to contain these barbarian invasions, Stilicho managed, managed to stifle the threat posed by the tribes under Radagaisus. When the, la when the latter split his forces into three separate groups, Stilicho con cornered Radagaisus near Florence and starved the invaders into submission. Meanwhile, Alaric bestowed with condicils of Magister Militum by Stilicho and now supplied by the West, awaited for one side or the other to incite him to action, as Stilicho faced further difficulties from more barbarians. Wow. Man, it just gets better and better, don't it? Now, we're going to talk about the second invasion of Italy, the agreement with Western Roman regime. Now, sometime in 406 and into 407, more large groups of barbarians consisting primarily of Vandals, Swaves and Albans crossed the Rhine into Gaul, while about the same time a rebellion occurred in Britain. Man, there's a bunch of shit going on at that time. Under a common soldier named Constantine, it spread to Gaul. Burdened by so many enemies, Stilicho's position was strained. During this crisis in 407, Alaric again marched on Italy, taking a position in Nor Noricum, or modern Austria where he demanded a sum of 4,000 pounds of gold to buy off another full-scale invasion. The Roman Senate loathed, loathed the idea of supporting Alaric. Zosimus observed that one senator famously de declaimed non est ista pax sed pactio servitutis, meaning this is not peace but a pact of servitude. Stilicho paid Alaric the 4,000 pounds of gold nevertheless. This agreement, sensible in view of the military situation, fatally weakened Stilicho's standing at Honorius's court. Twice, Stilicho had allowed Alaric to escape his grasp, and Radagasus had advanced all the way to the outskirts of Florence. Man, this is seeming a little bit rough, isn't it? A little bit rough. Now, renewed hostilities after Western Roman coup. In the east, Arcadius died on May 1st, 408, and was replaced by his son Theodosius II. Stilicho seems to have planned to march to Constantinople and to install there, there a regime loyal to himself. He may also have intended to give Alaric a senior official position and send him against the rebels in Gaul. Before Stilicho could do so, while he was away at Ticinum, at the head of a small detachment, a bloody coup against his supporters took place at Honorius' court. It was led by Honorius' minister, Olympius. Stilicho's small escort of Goths and Huns were commanded by a Goth, Sarus, whose Gothic troops massacred the Hun contingent in their sleep. And then... <coughs> and then withdrew towards the cities in which their own families were billeted. That's fuck, That's cold, y'all. That's cold. Their own families? God damn, man. What kind of remorseless sons of bitches are they? Stilicho ordered that Saris's goth, Goths should not be admitted, but now, without an army, 
he was forced to flee for sanctuary. Agents of Olympias promised Stilicho his life, but instead betrayed and killed him. Alaric was again declared an enemy of the emperor. emperor. Olympias' men then massacred the families of the Federate troops as presumed supporters of Stilicho, although they had probably rebelled against him. And the troops defected en masse to Alaric. Many thousands of barbarians, auxiliaries, along with their wives and children, joined Alaric in Noricum. The conspirators seemed to have let their main army disintegrate and had no policy except hunting down supporters of Stilicho. Italy was left without effective and indigenous defense forces thereafter. As a declared enemy of the emperor, Alaric was denied the legitimacy that he needed to collect taxes and hold cities without large garrisons, which he could not afford to detach. He again offered to move his men, this time to Pannonia, in exchange for a modest sum of money and the modest title of Combs, but he was refused because Olympias' regime regarded him as a supporter of Stilicho. Give me a second, y'all. Yeah. 